Um, dear colleagues, welcome back. Um, and thank you for being on time. One should never punish those that um, have been here on time. So we start and a few more may join us um, as we, as we um, tackle now the, the second part of this in-session workshop, um, which focuses on climate finance access. <clears throat> the aim of this uh, segment two is to um, foster a dialogue amongst uh, recipient countries, multilateral climate funds, technical support providers and the private sector to define concrete action points. And as a, a scene setting presentation, we have uh, Gaia Larson, please join me welcoming her. She uh, works at the World Resources Institute and uh, she um, delivers a presentation on key challenges and opportunities. Gaia, the floor is yours. Very much. I'm going to stand up here. Um, so, yes, as all right, as was mentioned, I'm from the World Resources Institute, and we do uh, research in various places and um, and on various topics. And one of them that we've looked at a lot is climate finance. And our most recent uh, report on this is called "The Future of the Funds," and um, some of the information I'll be presenting here is from that report. And we've also done work previously uh, looking at the experiences of, for example, accredited entities um, that have been ac that have accessed money from the different funds and what issues did they face. So I'll also be speaking a bit um, about that that research. So this information that I'm going to uh, give you now is based on, as I said, um, more our recent research that looked at the seven multilateral climate funds out there. These are the ones listed here. Um, I'm sure most of you know about them, but it's the GEF, the LDCF, the SCCF, the Adaptation Fund, uh, the two SIFs, the Clean Technology Fund and the Strategic Climate Fund, which are um, you know, run at the world, out of the World Bank, as well as the Green Climate Fund. And they're listed here in order of the date in which they were created. So the GEF is the oldest and the GCF is the youngest. They're also um, color coordinated. So the blue ones are the ones that just focus on mitigation. The red ones just focus on adaptation and the green ones focus on both. Now, of course, there are a lot of other sources of climate finance out there, right? There's private finance, there's a lot of bilateral finance, there's um, uh, the MDBs, the National Development Banks, others. Um, so this is a snapshot. Uh, it just focuses on these multilateral funds, but these funds are quite important within the negotiation context, and many of them have been created through the negotiations. So it's quite important that they function effectively. So this is how much money has been pledged to the funds so far. As you can see, the GCF has a lot more money pledged to it than the others. Um, the, there's a number of smaller funds. All the adaptation-focused funds are quite small, something worth noting. Of course, the GCF also provides money for adaptation, so that doesn't mean that there isn't significant money flowing in that direction, but, um, but it, as we know, adaptation funding is, is more of a challenge, so uh, this is sort of interesting in that regard as well. Now, this slide shows how big the projects are that they fund on average. So the TTF funds really big projects compared to the others. So it's the Clean Technology Fund under the SIFs. And uh, the GCF here also, uh, as you can see, is funding pretty big projects. Now, I should th this number is actually, um, there are a couple of really big projects that were approved recently. So that has made that number go up a lot. Uh, in general, most projects are quite a bit smaller than, than this number. And, So we, we also looked at, okay, where in the country um, are these funds providing money, right? Because it's important in terms of the, the success of the funds and the success of um, and UNFCCC related financing that it reaches the places where it needs to be, um, you know, where it's most needed. So the map that you see up here is actually uh, showing how many funds each country gets money from. So it isn't necessarily talking about how much money they get, but but essentially, you know, who are they getting money from? So as you can see, a couple of countries are getting money from um, six of the funds. And a number of countries are getting uh, money from sort of three or four of the funds. And then um, uh, quite a few are also just getting money from one of the funds. 
Now, this, is a, this map is based on uh, non-NX1 countries, so the orange ones aren't getting any money, but um, they might, you know, it might be okay that they don't get money. They're not um, particularly um, poor or developing countries. So another question here is, okay, well, who's funding in what type of countries? Who is funding in least developed countries versus SIDS versus African countries? Uh, this graph shows out of all the, say, so for example, out of all the SIDS and out of all the LDCs, how many of them get money from these different funds? So the GEF, which funds um, a lot of countries around the world, is also funding a lot of LDCs, SIDS, and African countries. As you can see, almost all of the countries in those categories get money from the GEF. On the other side of the spectrum, the CTF and the FIP are focused on just a few countries. And some of these countries are not necessarily in this category of SIDS, LDCs, and African countries. So they, um, so basically, really fertility few of those countries are getting money from the from the the FIP and the STF, CTF. Sorry, the GCF is is still in its early stages. So um, it still it hasn't funded that many countries yet, and therefore it, it's not um, you know showing a high percentage here. But hopefully that month that will grow as time goes goes on. Now, probably most people in this room have heard of direct access and the fact that the adaptation fund and the GCF have have been piloting and also to the, the GEF to some extent this uh, this modality to help money go straight to countries rather than going through um, other implementing entities like the UN bodies or the multilateral development banks. So we looked at, okay, well, you know, how many um, institutions are accredited to these funds and what type of institutions are they? As you can see here, the Adaptation Fund actually has quite a few national development banks, no, sorry, national institutions. Um, they can be government or non-governmental or even private sector um, direct access entities. Our, um, the Adaptation Fund has quite a few, 25% uh, out of um, around 40 or so accredited entities. The GCF has a, a big mix of a lot of different types of entities, the national ones, smaller regional ones, UN bodies, multilateral development banks, um, and on. The SIFs only go through um, multilateral development banks, so that's all they have there. And then the GEF has a smaller number of accredited entities that uh, you know, also is, is relatively diverse, but again, a smaller number. So, the accreditation process is, as you may have heard, rather rigorous and rather difficult. So while these numbers uh, on this previous slide show that, well, I can't go back, so remember the previous slide. Uh, you know, there, there, it's a, there's a fair number of, of entities that have been accredited, but if you look at that compared to all the countries in the world, it's actually a small number, 25 accredited entities to the Adaptation Fund or um, 14 here to the GCF. So, why is this? Well, in part, it's because the uh, accreditation process is very rigorous and it's time consuming. So this, this is actually from 2015 when we went and we interviewed all the accredited entities, the Adaptation Fund and the GCF at that point in time. And it just shows how long it took for them to achieve accreditation. And as you can see, it really varies. Uh, some of them, it was, it took you know, less than five months. Some of them uh, it took more than two years. And the reasons for that also vary. Um, but the, some of the sort of main challenges that people faced were just access to information about what the requirements were and what the documentation was needed um, in order to show that they met those requirements. Because uh, it's not enough for the entities to go and just say, oh, we have a say, for example, a safeguard policy, here's our safeguard policy. They actually need to show how they've implemented that in various programs and projects so that there's evidence uh, you know, that they are able to implement these policies. And you can probably understand why that would be. Um, people want to make sure that the money is going to entities that are able to take care of the money. On the other hand, it, it is quite burdensome and difficult and, and it takes a long time. So there's this balance there that, that people are trying to strike between, between time commitment and rigorousness and, you know, ability to actually get the money out to these institutions. So there's one thing to talk about who is accredited Another thing to look at where the money is going. And actually right now, most of the money continues to flow to the multilateral development banks or uh, the UN bodies. 
and that includes at the Adaptation Fund and at the GCF. Now, this money is, or sorry, this figure is based on how much money and not the number of projects. And a lot of times the projects that are run by the national entities are smaller. So if you look at the number of projects, the percentage might change a bit. But it is nonetheless, I think, very worthy to note that you know, we still have this issue of the MDBs and the UN, UN bodies um, accessing most of the funding. Now, after you become accredited and you, uh, you know, you're sort of eligible to receive funding, uh, you still have to submit a project proposal to these, to these various funds. Interestingly, it takes about the same amount of time at the different funds to get your project approved. It's not quick, uh, almost two years. Um, and that is because you have to go through a lot of, again, assessments uh, and other analysis to make sure that your project is uh, one that can be funded. And challenges that, that people have faced here, you know, include the fact that it's, it is costly to put together a project. Uh, it does require a lot of internal coordination within the country. It requires a lot of co coordination with other um, stakeholders if you want to do it effectively and efficiently. And again, you have to also understand the requirements and get the, all the paperwork right. And so it, it, it is not an easy process and, and, you know, people are getting through it, but, but it takes a while. One notable point here is that the Adaptation Fund is a bit faster than the others. And actually, the Adaptation Fund does provide money to smaller projects, so that may help a little bit with the speed. But they also have a bit more um, resources for the administrative side. So the, um, relative to the sort of administrative budget of the um, other funds, the Adaptation Fund has, has a sort of decent-sized budget. And that could probably be why, why they can move faster. Right, so there's a trade-off there between how much you spend on administration and how much how quickly things go. And then, so just the last few slides here. As we've mentioned, these funds are not um, they're not even going to be remotely close to enough to meet all the needs. So one of the important aspects is will these funds be able to uh, a meet you know go where the money is most needed and provide that money in the means that is most necessary, but also will they be able to leverage other types of money and will countries be able to use these funds to get access to other money? So all the funds except for um, the LDCF, the SCCF, and the Adaptation Fund, uh, well, all the funds can use grants and then in all the funds except those three can also use other types of funding to that loans, uh, guarantees, equity, and that, so other types of investments that can, um, in some cases, help you know, sort of mobilize additional funding, especially from the private sector. Uh, the Jeff, um, there's little stars next to the Jeff checks because uh, it doesn't. Uh, the Jeff hasn't tended to use that particularly often, but they do have a small pilot program which enables the use of such um, tools. So, what is that translated into? Well, okay, so this possibly slightly confusing looking slide, I will explain to you. So the it's basically showing the co-financing rates. So the dark green is how much money the funds have put in. The light green is how much money they their sources based on that money. And the, the dots are the ratio between those two. The adaptation fund looks, you know, sad here, but that is because uh, they don't necessarily have a good requirement to mobilize additional funding and therefore they don't report on that so it's not to say that they don't, there isn't any mobilization, it's just not reported and therefore it's, it's shown as here, zero here. But um, the CTF and the GEF show, uh, show, as you can see here, are quite good at mobilizing additional finance, but so is, for example, the SCCF. Although it's a quite small fund, it is managed in, in comparatively per dollar to mobilize quite a bit of money. Now, finally, where does that money come from? This slide shows, so of the co-finance money, you know, is that money from other multilateral banks is, or institutions? Is it from the government itself? Is it from the private sector? Or is it from other sources? And what we see here is there's still a lot of multilateral um, co-financing. So for example, the GCF funds something that the World Bank is also funding. Um, but there is uh, also some degree of private sector mobilization, particularly at the CTF. Uh, they've, the CTF does emphasize the mitigation and technology, which you know, is oftentimes more easier uh, to bring in private sector finance for. 
the FIP has been particularly good at getting in uh, government finance from the from the government themselves. And that is that is the end of those slides. So, in in summary, essentially, the, the funds are moving forward. It is a slow and arduous process for a lot of the countries. And um, some of the challenges that, that we continue to face it is just getting the information out there, getting the right expertise out there, and enabling the countries to understand the requirements and to show you know, the paperwork, et cetera, necessary to meet those requirements. And the full report is available online. I have an executive summary also with me if you like that in printout. And we have other reports also on climate finance, including um, the one we did focused on sort of direct access, also available on our website. Thank you very much, Gaia. We have time for uh, two questions or comments from the audience. Yes, please. Thank you. And I think I know the um, answer to my question, but that was super useful and interesting overall. But my question is about the time for approval of projects. And I know you didn't have the GCF up there, and I'm, I'm assuming it's because it's still reasonably new to get an average. But do you have any kind of preliminary figures on how it compares to the other funds? Yeah, no, thanks for that. I should have mentioned that that is the reason the GCF wasn't up there. It was hard to get an accurate uh, assessment of the, the you compared to, compared to the others. Um, I mean, our understanding so far is that actually the GCF is doing reasonably well compared to the other funds. Um, now, what one considers to be the standard of good, good, like how quickly one something should go, you know, maybe the, comparing with other funds isn't isn't the right average, but you know, compared to other funds, the GCF seems to be in that range. Thank you very much. Second question, comment. Yes, please, Saint Lucia. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation, very enlightening indeed, um, well received. I just had a question relating to the whole notion of movement of projects in pipelines. Uh, you mentioned that for the adaptation fund, um, a possible reason why the projects could have been moving more quickly was because of the administrative fee allowed. Well the administrative costs associated with that. So I was just wondering if there was any other possible reason that you would have identified or may have identified in your study as it relates to the MDBs, um, bearing in mind that they also do a fee for administration of projects, which is possibly one of the challenges that particularly Caribbean SIDS have had in the past. So was there any other thing that could shed some light on that? Yeah. So. Just so one clarifying point on the adaptation fund is that the, it's not, so it's the adaptation fund, you know, basically the fund itself has a decent number of staff members who are able to move projects through. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that the, because then there's also um, fees, administrative fees that the implementing entities can also charge, um, which is a little bit different. Uh, we also, I mean, we did see that, for example, the Jeff. Uh, and the other entities that are underneath the Jeff are also relatively uh, quick because they can um, World Bank, or rather, they're seen as somewhat cheap because they can reuse the World Bank's sort of massive amounts of people um, and, and infrastructure because they work out of the World Bank. So there's, it's also kind of hard to compare. So when I say that the adaptation fund is potentially more expensive, um, another reason why it seems more expensive is that the other funds are actually able to maybe take advantage of the fact that they're part of, for example, the World Bank and therefore can use their, those resources more efficiently. Um, now, I mean, in terms of the question of MDBs charging money to do work at the country level, I think it is actually a slightly different issue and we didn't necessarily work look at that directly. Um, and that looks, you know, because that's more like uh, how long does it take to implement the project once it's been approved or, or get a project through the process? Uh, and it's a fair question and something that, that should be looked at. Thank you, Gaia. Maybe one of your next reports. Um, so yeah. I strongly recommend that you go and, and look at the report. I think it, it contains a lot of uh, information, factual information and data uh, that we can use in our further deliberations. Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. Gaia. Oh, there's a question. Sorry, I didn't look to the left. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Um, yeah, just some clarifications on the... Unfortunately for me, I sit on the boards of all these funds, so... You do, yeah. Because <laughs> uh, uh, 
the, the first thing on your slide, uh, it's not the CTF, it's the CIFs. The CTF itself only deals with what the World Bank calls middle income countries, where you're listing it as multilateral. They are not multilateral because not all countries are eligible uh, in the CIFs. So the CTF is roughly only about 20 countries that can get money from the CIFs. Yeah. So uh, it may be a bit misleading on your slide when okay. you list them as uh, multilateral. I look at the figures on the, uh, you've listed Jeff 5 and Jeff 6, right? Yes, exactly. Uh, so rather than compare from the beginning, because most of the other funds no, are sure, yeah. Uh, I yeah. think the question is, you, you listed as 3 billion, but roughly in the Jeff, we usually have at around 1 billion per uh, replenishment cycle. So Jeff 5 would be 1 and Jeff uh, 6 would be 1. I imagine you're probably looking at the climate benefits of the other focal areas and something like that. Yeah, we tried to do an assessment of what the, the ones that were relevant to climate change. Okay, because it can be a bit misleading for for people when you see this report because in my case I participate in the replenishment and if my minister sees this and asks me how much money am I putting in there actually uh, when I uh, record uh, on that. Um, some of the other stuff, I mean I don't want to go into too much of the detail. Yeah, we're happy but, to speak with uh, you. On the adaptation fund I can tell you it's not really the, uh, the administrative uh, budgets that makes it go faster. Uh, having served twice on the board of the, the adaptation fund is not as cumbersome in terms of the uh, amounts of uh, paperwork that you need to complete and things like that. And it has a fairly much more easier bureaucracy to, to deal with. But I think you, you might want to ask uh, Mr. Hofmeister when he comes up there, what is the period with which the GCF uh, takes in terms of the, the projects? He said <laughs> I shouldn't put him on the spot, but no, you did. You wanted to put the board members on the spot, but I think he, he'll be able to give you a better sense of, uh, of, of on that. I, I think you just need to just look at how things, because it could be a bit misleading to some people. Thanks. Thanks. Yep. Thank you, Zaire, for pointing that out. I think uh, useful uh, for the reader to to take that into consideration. And thanks again, Gaia, for the presentation. Uh, with that, we 